Good morning. Uh, for those who, who knows, might be coming in and watching, perhaps even for the first time. Um, I wait a couple of minutes so that I can see how many people have uh, tuned in. I do that so I know that I'm not talking just into the air. So we've got a good group now. Good morning. Um, good to see everyone. I say that every week and I can't see you, but I know you're there. I know you're there. Um, before we get into the study, just want to remind everyone that next week will be our last um, study and then we go into summer break. And we will return, uh, Women's Bible Study will return in the fall. Now that's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, will we return face to face? Um, or will we need to continue in this venue? We will see about that. I think everybody is more hopeful these days because um, I just heard yesterday that 85% of uh, 65 and older have been vaccinated. So that's wonderful. And uh, hopefully those numbers will continue to go up. Um, I've been uh, vaccinated twice now, and Ethan has been vaccinated once. And so um, we hope that you uh, take advantage of and have access uh, to that. Uh, that's not a command. That's just a, um, a statement of fact. Let's put it that way. So. In the fall, we will not um, make that decision probably until we get to the fall, but it sure would be lovely to um, be together again uh, as a group. Um, today, I am uh, looking at Psalm 71, Psalm 71, which um, is a bit longer than some Psalms that we've looked at. But um, one of my favorites and an important one, I think. Uh, during this very short uh, series on the Psalms, I have tried to give you uh, different ways to look at a Psalm. Um, we've done a pretty intense um, study of intertextuality with Psalm 22. And then we did some... Um, work in Psalm 51 that was um, more of a story that I told you, uh, weaving passages of scripture and a narrative together. And then last week um, we did Electio Divina on Psalm uh, 62, I think. And today um, I'm going to use Psalm 71 to point out um, just some basic ideas about um, poetry and how um, the Psalms are the work of a poet. So we're going to go in that direction uh, today. And by the way, if you have downloaded the slides, they are out of order. So the last slide that you have needs to be shuffled up a bit. Sorry about that. Not quite sure how that happened, but let's start. <clears throat> My reading Psalm <clears throat> 71. This is from the NIV. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge, to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, my God, from the hands of the wicked, from the grasp of those who are evil and cruel. 
For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, and my confidence since my youth. From birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will praise you. I will ever praise you. I have become a sign to many. You are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise, declaring your splendor all day long. Do not cast me away when I am old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone. For my enemies speak against me. Those who wait to kill me conspire together. They say God has forsaken him. Pursue him and seize him for no one will rescue him. Do not be far from me, my God. Come quickly, God, to help me. May my accusers perish in shame. May those who want to harm me be covered with scorn and disgrace. As for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long, though I know not how to relate them all. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things. Who is like you, God? Though you have made me see trouble, many and bitter, you will restore my life again. From the depths of the earth, you will again bring me up. You will increase my honor and comfort me once more. I will praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, my God. I will sing praise to you with the lyre, Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you, I whom you have delivered. My tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long for those who wanted to harm me have been put to shame and confusion having spent the last um, few weeks now in the psalms um, i'm not sure that this is a bad thing i think this is a very good thing that once you read and read and read um, we, we almost have one psalm message throughout the entire um, book of Psalms 150. Now, what is that message? That message is, you, O oh God, um, are worthy to be praised. God, where are you? I lament but you are worthy to be praised. As I grow, you are worthy to be praised. There are enemies that are trying to um, attack and destroy me, and I will give you praise. You are trustworthy in all things, and I will give you praise. These are the common themes almost in every psalm. We find that again here in Psalm 71. And so, um, as I said, I would like to look at just a little bit um, of what poetry is. 
and why psalms are good poetry. By the way, I should mention that these don't rhyme because they're translated into English. Um, in the Hebrew, there would have been a rhyming scheme that the writer of the psalms um, have used. It's one reason I wish I knew Hebrew, just so I could hear the um, the original cadence and the original um, rhyming schemes. But the psalms are um, songs, and we can say that lyrics to songs are um, poems. So I would really, really, really strongly say that if reading poetry is not a part of your um, life, um, your routine, that you perhaps try to pick that up. There are lots of good Christian poets. There are poets um, from different perspectives. But what does poetry do? Why is poetry important to us? Um, just some comments here. Some are mine, some are from the internet. Um, poetry reaches with its sounds and rhythms down below the realm of the conscious mind to awaken and nourish the imagination. Um, Eugene Peterson um, wrote a book called The Contemplative Pastor, and he makes the argument that every pastor should be a poet um, because preaching <clears throat> in and of itself, besides all facets of uh, pastoral ministry, need to nourish the imagination. And one of our roles is to um, continue to, to in, ignite in our people um, the ability to imagine. And Eugene Peterson says, we live in a wonderful world of imagination um, when we are young. Um, it's one of the, the ways that the uh, uh, children play is to uh, ignite their imagination. I remember when I was a child, um, you know, we go out um, after we came home from school came in for dinner, but in those times we were playing with other children and creating all sorts of scenarios. So why is it <clears throat> that we think when we mature, we must kill our imagination? And so poetry has this um, way of uh, speaking and writing that um, kind of brushes off that part of our brain and um, can ignite something into us. Uh, second point here, great poetry has the power to start a fire in a person's life. It can alter the way we see ourselves. It can change the way we see the world. You may never have read a poem in your life, and yet you can pick up a volume of poetry, open it to any page, and suddenly find yourself blown away, blown into a world full of awe, dread, wonder, marvel, deep sorrow, and joy. Three, poetry at its best calls forth our sort of deepest being. Um, where we um, exist in the inner parts. Let's use that phrase from the Psalms. Um, it dares us to break free from safe strategies of a conscious mind. It calls us, um, here's a metaphor, like wild geese, <clears throat> as Mary Oliver would say, from an open sky. So she wrote a poem Poem. I'm sorry. My mother always said poem. I'm from Maryland. They say poem. So forgive me. Um, poem. Mary Oliver would say um, um, wild geese. Poems are like wild geese that open the sky to us.
It is an art and always has been a shaping of language designed to open our eyes, open our doors, and welcome us into a bigger world, one of possibilities we may never have dared to dream of. Four, this is why poetry can feel dangerous as well as necessary. Poetry can be dangerous because we may never be the same again after we read a poem that happens to speak to our own life directly. Um, it's almost as if they uh, catch us by surprise of how quickly they can go here. I know that when I meet my own life in a great poem, I feel opened, clarified, confirmed somehow in what I sensed was true, but had no words for. Anything that can do that is surely necessary for the fullness of human life. And then uh, five, poetry masterfully uses indirect communication. Indirect communication is a way of like getting your attention, but through the back door. Um, it's a way of helping us hear better sometimes than direct communication. This is why we love stories more than we like abstract textbooks. It's why we love stories so much. We are drawn to a narrative. We're drawn to images. We're drawn to metaphors instead of sitting down and um, reading a math textbook or even a theology textbook for that matter, depending on how um, the author of that textbook is is attuned to indirect as well as direct communication. So Mary Oliver is my very favorite um, poet. She's one of the great poets of the 20th and 21st centuries. She just died a couple of years ago. Um, she has many, many books. Uh, she also has a collection, which is called Devotions. And so um, to be honest, when I sit down to do my devotions, I have my journal, I have um, the Bible, of course, um, and I have Mary Oliver's book of poetry. Not that I'm putting those on the same scale, but often um, I will just um, read from that and something will um, speak to me deeply. And then in my journal, I will um, write out of that insight that she might have, and then the insights I receive uh, from scripture, and um, sort of journal about that, that new insight for the day. I love Mary Oliver. When she died, <laughs> I cried. In fact, in my journal, I have a place that says this page is blank in honor of Mary Oliver. Maybe you have a poet um, that has been like that. Um, to you. So I'm going to give you um, one of her um, poems uh, just as an example of some of what we're talking about. So this is um, an excerpt from her poem to begin with, Sweet Grass, um, which is in the uh, collected volume, Devotions, on page 79. What I loved in the beginning, I think, was mostly myself. Never mind that I had to, since somebody had to. That was many years ago. Since then, I have gone out of my confinements, though with difficulty. I mean the ones that thought to rule my heart. I cast them out, I put them on the mush pile. They will be nourishment someday. Everything is nourishment 
somehow or another. I have become a child of the clouds and of hope. I have become a friend of the enemy, whoever that is. I have become older and cherishing what I have learned, I have become younger. And what do I risk to tell you this? Which is all I know. Love yourself, then forget it, then love the world. I wish I could go through and exegete that uh, for us, but um, some powerful connections there. In her own life, which yeah, we don't have access in the poem to what she has endured in life. Um, but I love her idea that as I have aged, um, hopefully I have become younger through what I have learned. So the Psalms, the Psalms are primarily um, poems, as I said, uh, song lyrics. And so um, what do we want to say about uh, the Psalms as uh, poetry in, in their ability also, as I've explained, yeah, it's hot in my office. It's always hot in my office. Um, to see how they, they also share some of these, this great benefit of poetry uh, into our hearts. So um, just some ideas off the top of my head. Well, a little deeper than that. Um, Psalms. They make us use our imaginations. Just as I said that... Um, uh, P. Peterson, Eugene Peterson, has said that we sometimes we shut down our imaginations. Psalms are a way of, of uh, igniting again our imaginations by painting images throughout each psalm. So we have metaphors, um, refuge, rescue, fortress. All of those have. Um, a concrete meaning, and yet um, the psalmist is using them metaphorically. Um, we don't actually, you know, with our bodies walk into a fortress, but we have this sense that we know what that means, and therefore we can um, holistically, spiritually, walk into a fortress where we know that, that God um, protects us. Um, one in this psalm is that um, God has an ear. We use that so much, we probably think it's a concrete reality. God does not have an ear. <laughs> Jesus had an ear. He had two. But um, God is spirit, we are told. And so God actually does not have a body before Jesus. But, but he uses that to, again, have us imagine that um, God is listening to us intently. That when we pray, when we, and we pray in ways that we don't have any words, God is listening to our hearts. So God has an ear. And then through many, many Psalms, a bit of it is in Psalm 71, um, that he invokes nature. Um, as giving us a glimpse of the wonder of our creator. Um, in this one, um, God is a rock. God's um, righteousness reaches to the skies. From the depth of the earth, you restore my life. So again, these, um, these images of nature, um, bring us to a deeper understanding of God, our creator. Um, another thing that I'm, we need to be intentional about, as I said, as a kid, you come home from school and you go right out into the woods, so to speak. Not so more, much anymore because of our concerns, but just that freedom <laughs> to go and run and play. Um, I think we all still need um, nature 
We need to put ourselves in situations where we can look at the beauty, particularly now it's spring, the beauty of the world and that God created every intricate detail and that we can sense God through nature. Um, theologians for a thousand years have been saying that, that nature is a conduit for, um, for, for the presence and the knowledge of God. Psalms point us to deeper truths than we might um, be able to imagine on our own. Uh, the Psalms can take us to a place spiritually um, of deep intimacy, uh, a place where, um, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, where David or a psalmist's um, words become our words, that they articulate something that we cannot quite come up with on our own. And so we can, with the psalmist, through the words that he has written, um, express ourselves to God. They help us uh, construct a theology of God that will sustain us. Now, theology simply means uh, words about God, that it's as simple as that. And so I'm not using this in some sort of abstract sense that you know, I can go over there and I have about seven or eight systematic theologies sitting on my shelf and pick one up. I mean, that's a, a scholarly endeavor. But all of us are theologians. It's something that we like to tell um, our students here because you are constructing um, an idea about who God is and who God is to you, hopefully. And so the Psalms give us this um, practical life, uh, breathing, um, understandings about God that will sustain us in the dark times. Um, one thing that you might consider to do sometime is to sit down with a blank piece of paper and just spend some time and write down everything that you believe about God, every characteristic of God. And in doing that, you are constructing a life theology um, that you can then go and look at when uh, life is difficult. This, these are the things that I affirm about the nature and particularly the love of God for me. Psalms challenge us to break free of particular patterns in our life and enter a world of new possibilities. In other words, Psalms should stretch us. They should um, challenge us. So back to that point that poetry um, can be dangerous, uh, that makes more sense here when we find uh, a Psalm that um, challenges us to move forward. Um, and we might not like that. But if we read the Psalms, we have, again, this, this sense not only of who God is, but who, who I am. And in God, where perhaps I might need to go. Psalms help us express the inexpressible. Whether that be words of lament. We talked about lament uh, in this series earlier. Laments are um, words or even uh, groans or moans um, asking God where, where God is. Why have you not shown up in this situation? Um, I don't understand what you're doing. <clears throat> or even, God, are you failing me? There is a, a question. Um, and we looked at Psalm 22, where Jesus um, 
praise the psalm um, from the cross by saying, Aloy, uh, Aloy, Lama Shabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a lament, that's a pouring out. Um, and so, psalms in, in their laments can express for us what we cannot articulate ourselves. You can pretty much find any emotion um, in the book of Psalms. And then, of course, they also perhaps express the inexpressible in terms of praise. Um, obviously, uh, there are a great number of Psalms that simply focus on praise for who God is and what God does. And um, sometimes we need somebody else's voice to be able to praise God. You notice in church every Sunday morning, we have an, what we call an opening invocation kind of psalm. And um, they are to draw us into worship. And so at College Church, we read them responsibly um, so that um, we can put in our mouths uh, words of praise. The, we use the Psalms to do that, even in corporate worship. And then um, the Psalms are a mixture of direct and indirect communication. Um, which I mentioned before. I mean, David can say something straight out, um, or the psalmist might come through the back door in, in using metaphors and imagery and narrative um, to help uh, get to a different part of our brain. We've got the logical brain, the abstract brain, but we also have the brain, which is the uh, seat of the um emotional life, that's not even an adequate enough word, uh, the part of the brain that um, senses, it's where we get not just abstract thought, but art and um, music. And so the Psalms are a mixture of direct and indirect communication. Well, I've been with you for, I think it's four years from now. So even if you're just dropping by, that doesn't mean you have to leave. But um, I hope that I have expressed um, how much I love you um, in our women's Bible study. <clears throat> those that I know well and those who uh, stared at me from across the room that I'm trying to get to know. But um, I've also expressed this. Um, when my mother died, all of a sudden I had 70 mothers looking at me, and that was very sustaining for me. Um, you have a very uh, special place in my heart. And um, you continue to just shower me with um, gifts and cards and love. And I really feel like I do not deserve you. Um, you are amazing, so I'm going to cry. Um, anyway, all that to say... I feel that I can be vulnerable, and so what I'm going to do here is um, read a section of my journal. <clears throat> but the reason I'm doing this um, is to give you an example. Uh, perhaps you've heard the phrase, what does it mean to pray the Psalms? What does it mean to pray the Psalms? You might have heard that verse before. And every time that you read a psalm, of course, you are praying what uh, the psalmist is praying, particularly as the psalmist um, prays to God. But there are also creative ways that you can um, use a psalm. And so I'm going to show you an example of that. Um, thank you for allowing me to do that and to be a part of your life. So here's a part of my life. So <clears throat> for those of you who do not know, my son, Ethan, who is an incredible human being, he is now 25 years old, which I can hardly believe. 
Um, we moved to Nampa when he was two. So basically this is all he's ever known. Even though he keeps saying, I wanna go home. I wanna see my home. And what he means is New Jersey, cause that's where he was born. He remembers nothing about New Jersey, but he has this sense of you know, his roots. It's quite funny actually. Um, but he was diagnosed with ADHD when he was five. And then um, when he was seven, they added to that diagnosis um, Asperger's syndrome. Uh, if you don't know what that is, you might look it up, but it is um, a, one of the autism spectrum disorders. And um, unless you have a, a child um, who is disabled in some way, it's really hard to articulate, um, particularly when you first hear the news. So when he was seven, um, I was absolutely devastated. And then when we find out that on top of that, he had learning disabilities and that he would not probably go on to live a typical um, life. Um, it, I went through a very, very difficult time. Um, we made it through Ethan graduating from high school. Um, he was mainstreamed in everything but math and English. Um, and he received a real high school diploma. That was the praise. And then we said we would we would try to see, um, just see how he could handle um, college. And college ended up being an absolutely wonderful experience for Ethan. He lived in the dorms, he made friends, um, people treated him with dignity and respect. Um, he took four years uh, to complete an associate's degree. And so I got to um, watch him walk across the stage at baccalaureate, I was, um, able to put uh, his hood around his neck, his bachelor's hood, in this case, an associate's hood, which we do every year at commencement. We hood our students. Um, and uh, then after he graduated, the question is, um, what is next? And Ethan is a very unique individual in that in some things, um, he has an IQ off the chart and in other things, he has a very low IQ to the point that those who have tested him through the years, we've had him tested uh, probably three or four times, have said that we can't give him an IQ because it is so different, the ranges of things that he can do and things that he cannot do. And so um, in consultation with others, we decided um, that we would apply for uh, Social Security Disability, believing that he really was not able to um, work a 40 hour a week job. Um, and so we started on a, this two year process um, from being rejected twice to getting a lawyer. All these you wait for months. Finally, we were before a judge. The judge decided she wanted to wait a couple of more months and get more information. And so finally, um, we heard that he was approved for this in December, which is um, something that we praise God for but it doesn't mean that Ethan um, is suddenly okay. <laughs> He's okay, but not okay. Um, I can't tell you how much I love him. Um, so we're trying to find things for him to do that are meaningful in life. He does um, faithfully help with children's church every week. Um, and we're trying to look for different opportunities. But in terms of um, working a full-time job, that probably is 
Um, not going to happen for him. Um, people with autism don't get better. It's, it's a condition that is a lifelong condition. Anyway, all of that to say that um, the first hearing we had this year was on July 9th. And um, so I was um, praying and I was uh, reading Psalm, Psalm 71. And um, so this is from my journal uh, just a few days before that hearing. So here we go. Ethan has his hearing soon, July 9th, to determine if he qualifies for disability. We met with a lawyer last week. I have never been so optimistic. We will see. It has been a long two-year process. If he doesn't get it, the question is, what is next for him? Either way, I so want him to find meaning in his life somehow. And this is what the poet says today. I call her the poet in my journal. So from one of her poems called, I Worried. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Is my eyesight failing or am I just imagining it? Am I going to have rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that my worrying had come to nothing. So I gave it up. And I took my old body and went, I went out in the morn, into the morning and I sang. Psalm 71, modified from a mother. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Never let him, Ethan, be put to shame. Rescue him and deliver him in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me and save him. Be his rock and refuge, to which he can always go. Give the command to save him, for you are our rock and fortress. Deliver him, O oh my God, from the hands of the wicked, from the grasp of the evil and cruel. For you have been my hope, O oh Lord, my confidence in his youth. From his birth, I have relied on you. You brought him out of my womb. I will ever praise you. He has become like a portent to many, but you are his strong refuge. Do not cast him away when I am old. Do not forsake him when my strength is gone. Be not from him, O oh God. I don't know what that means. This is a typo somehow. Oh, do not be far from him, O oh God. Come quickly. O oh my God, to help him, may his accusers perish in shame. May those who want to harm him be covered in scorn and disgrace. Since his youth, O oh God, you have taught him, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds for him. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake him, O oh God. I will declare your power to my next generation, your might to all who might come after him. Your righteousness reaches to the sky, O oh God. You have done great things for him. 
Who, O oh God, is like you? We will praise you for your faithfulness, O oh God. We will sing praise to you, O oh Holy One. Our lips will shout for joy when we sing praise to you. We, whom you have redeemed, I will praise you no matter what. So there are creative ways that you can use the, the Psalms and to pray them. Um, you don't have to be concerned about every verse or every meaning. But these are ways um, as we pray the pray the Psalms as finding words to express um, our deepest thoughts and hopes and needs and longings. Um, Psalms uh, are powerful. They are scripture. They are a means of grace. And then um, also vulnerability here. <clears throat> I write poetry. I would suggest that you just try it. Um, it doesn't have to rhyme. In fact, the great poets most of the time don't rhyme. Um, my best poetry, I don't rhyme. This one has happens to uh, rhyme. And so the title of this, which I guess I didn't include, is All is Life. And I'll read it to you as we close today. Uh, thank you for listening. When, I should say, I, I haven't been saying lately that all of my, I call them slides, um, but the things that I use here um, are posted on our college church website under women's ministries. So if you would like to have um, anything that I've said today or any week, um, they are posted there. Um, so I'm giving you this uh, poem today. Um, just ask that you don't publish it under your name and we'll be cool. All is life. When real love springs forth like day, erupts and engulfs the soul. It calms the heart that has been frayed and peaceably finds its goal. I wonder why it took so long to be so struck by joy, a joy that grows now fast and strong, that quiets life's numb noise. So, Love beyond all nature rise, transcend the heavens and the skies, dig low and deep within me cleanse, all else the dross the wounding mend. Love enthroned, tis the key, light reveals what I believe, God as God fades struggling strife. All is well, for all is life. When love welcomes each new night and drives out all fright and fear, all darkness succumbs to God's pure light. Perfect love can wipe all tears. I wonder why I haven't seen when God was present still that love and grace have always been spilt out to have my fill. Love beyond all nature rise, transcend the heavens and the skies, dig low and deep, within me cleanse, all else the dross, the wounding mend, God fades, struggling strife, all is well. For all is life. When the future beckons at my door, 
moving meaning now to center stage and asks and probes what's at my core to last me through remaining days. <clears throat> I wonder what I'll leave behind as I cry, oh death, where is thy sting? I hope it's hope that you will find when I raise my voice and sing. Love beyond all nature rose, transcended the heavens when the sky seemed closed. Love dug deep, now I am cleansed. All else the dross the wounding meant. Love enthroned and finally, a light reveals with my eyes I see, God is God, no struggling strife, and all is now eternal life. All is real, and I am free. Love has won the victory. Poetry um, helps when we read it. Poetry can help our healing when we write it. And the poetry we find in the Psalms can be a means of grace to us that helps us in our process of becoming um, that child of God that looks like Jesus, who then has eternity to spend with him. Well, <clears throat> I would like to pray before we go today. And um, I uh, have no way of knowing what is on your heart, but um, we do want to pray for those in our congregation. Uh, we have people who are having surgery even today, people who are sick, people who are recovering. And it's easy for us to um, bring those physical needs. Uh, we, are, we are of the practice, which is a good thing. We are of the practice of bringing those people um, to God who are struggling physically. We probably aren't as uh, attuned to um, pray for spiritual needs, uh, emotional needs, psychological needs, uh, financial needs. And so I'm sure that as I pray, you have someone in your life, even um, beyond those physical needs that um, you can remember now as I express our prayer in words um, to lift them to God. Uh, I love you, and I'll see you next week as um, we go through our last psalm. So let's pray. Holy God, I thank you uh, this morning for all of Scripture and particularly for the book of Psalms that um, was written over a period of time um, where David and other poets, songwriters, expressed for us um, almost every emotion we can imagine. And so thank you for how helpful they are to our spiritual journey. Um, I pray that we would continue to read them and study them, but particularly allow them to speak for us as we pray to you. Lord, I thank you for um, the women who are in this group. I thank you for those who might just stop in from time to time online. Um, we all have needs, and we lift those to you today, those that we love, those that we care for, We do pray for those in our congregation that need help. We pray for the church universal, 
and that Christians would be a witness to the light and love of you, O oh God. And we pray for this world. We don't even have words. We don't know what to say. It seems so immense. The needs, um, what we perceive as danger, um, what we perceive as immoral, we don't have the words, but we are promised that you do, O Holy Spirit. And so I pray that the Holy Spirit would, as we know you do, um, permeate, spread your um, prevenient grace, uh, your love all over the world into every situation for those who are in desperate need, for those who are victims of war, for those who have lost their way, for those who have given up on the church, We pray that you might continue to illuminate us in how we can be the hands and feet of Jesus and express the heart of Jesus in our world with the people that we know, with the people that we love. We thank you for spring, for new life, for hope, for joy, we thank you that you have um, created this uh, incredible earth for us uh, to enjoy and to have a glimpse of your nature. And so I pray for all of these beautiful, wonderful women that they would have a week in which they sense the presence of the Holy Spirit very close to them giving us power to do what we need to do. Um, we give you praise. In Christ's name, amen. All right, I'll see you next week.